I've had very, very high time pilots consider this some of the most difficult flying that they've ever had to do. That little black box is actually an insanely complex image capture system. And uh, maybe for some added perspective, it's useful to think about it in terms of like standard commercial satellite. Nationwide right now, we have available 10 meter. If you pay, you can get three meters. That's uh, taking a square pixel and it's three meters by three meters. Ours are two inches by two inches per pixel. So it's a night and day difference. It's exponentially sharper. And this technology is actually being used to save the elephants. This particular camera has a thermal auto detect, so if it detects a heat signature, it can alert you automatically, which is actually a phenomenal application for uh, anti-poaching. And they're using the auto detect of heat signatures to identify large mammals within the preserve, track them, and ensure their safety. In the summer of 2019, I traveled to the West Coast to take part in a very special project. All right, so it's not really a secret here. I'm helping to build a Cub Crafters aircraft, and I feel like I'm cheating on my Vans aircraft, especially today, because I'm actually riveting. Didn't think I'd be doing that here. But this airplane is going to end up in Kenya to help elephants, and we're going to cover that story too, so it's all for the greater good. This will be a working airplane at an elephant sanctuary. We spent over a year planning this production and there were a ton of intense logistics involved. After doing the build assist program on the FX3, the plan was to take my family with me to Kenya to fly with the crew and learn about how they operate there. So we've got Stan here today, he's the inspector and he's gonna certify the airplane after he goes through in great detail, checking every nut and bolt and fastener and all the important stuff. Congratulations, Thanks. you built an airplane. That's a pretty smooth process. Nothing to it. Well, I wouldn't say nothing to it. Well, the events of 2020 obviously squashed the Africa trip for me, but the airplane did make it there. And I'm hoping soon we can pick up where we left off. But for now, I wanted to start to share this story because I've been sitting on this cool footage for too long. So beginning here in Hood River made sense. I've already shared one episode that I filmed on this trip. It covered my first hand propping lesson and flying a 1929 biplane. Another flight that I did here explored the opposite end of the spectrum flying a Top Cub rigged with some super high tech modern imaging equipment. This same technology is used on wildlife preserves, like the one we hope to work with in Kenya. My name is Brian Prang. I'm co-founder and vice president of TAC Aero. Uh, today we're going to go up and do a aerial survey flight. What you see here is a automated uh, camera system that captures multispectral imagery, both visual, thermal, and uh, near infrared. So we're able to do plant health analysis, uh, airplane counting or uh, this particular camera setup is typically used for wildfire monitoring. It has the ability to auto detect a heat signature and say, hey, you should be worried about that. And uh, then we can call in even before there's visible smoke or uh, necessarily a very obvious fire. And with last year's record setting wildfire season, Brian and his team have been very busy. Brian was adamant to let me know that they use ForeFlight for everything, which is very cool. They've been a long time sponsor of mine, so I appreciated seeing the application here. There it is, my capture area. I'll just go back and forth on those. Mow the lawn. Yeah, that is so cool. And I should mention that it was thanks to Brian and the team from TAC Aero wearing helmets like this one right here that convinced me to look into it for when I'm flying warbirds or just any sort of backcountry tailwheel. Jeremy at Tech Air was very passionate about trying to get more pilots to wear helmets. No doubt I miss having the wind flowing through my hair flying the T6 with the canopy open, but even for such a large airplane it's got a tight cockpit with a lot of hard sharp objects to hit your head on. So I am going to be helping to tell the story, trying to get more pilots to wear helmets when they fly airplanes like this or just any tailwheel, really anything where there's a chance you could hit your head, even in turbulence. Clear. Back with 
two, you got me? Oh, yeah. Hood River traffic, Yellow Cove crossing, and Parcher on 25, south to north. This technology is amazing on its own, but the integration into the Cub, outstanding. What's this turbine thingy? These are 28 volt and they're on both sides. They power a cabin box inside that's battery powered and we are completely independent of any aircraft electrical system. We should uh, probably take off on the grass because why not? Uh, yeah, exactly. Oh cool, I love that people come out to watch airplanes. Right, yeah. The backstory of how Brian and Jeremy from TAC Aero got into this is pretty cool. My business partner and I both deployed overseas to Iraq and Afghanistan and we use technology like this to uh, support the warfighter, gather uh, intelligence, uh, maybe route surveys, all these different military applications. But because the technology was so new, uh, unmanned systems had no real regulatory path into commercialization 10 years ago, uh, we said, well, we sure love Cubs has a very low vibration profile. It can fly very slowly, very low. And since filming in 2019, they've been so busy that they actually spun a new business out of this called Hood Tech Aero. River traffic, Yellow Cup, Pipe Up Juliet, taking it off the runway 25 grass, straight out. To be clear, this is not a paid plug. I just think it's really cool what they're doing. So let's go see how it works. Hello, Hood River. All right, we're gonna climb uh, straight out, kind of establish departure pattern via NOTAM with all the pilots for the fly-in uh, to 2,000 feet, and then we're gonna enter our, our capture pattern. Uh, so going back and forth and mowing the lawn. Sounds good. Got the beats flying with the door open, eh? I uh, love it. Good AC. So this camera system is uh, purpose-built here in Hood River, Oregon by the company Overwatch. It's a self-contained system. We give it power and data link and then a GPS fix. All of its own internal navigation, uh, very user-friendly. Uh, we use a tablet. You can interact with it, uh, turn it on, turn it off, manage the capture. We've got a hard drive in here and after the flight we just pull the data and uh, take it to a computer to process. All right, we'll get uh, our camera set up to capture. I'll hand that back to you. You can check it out. You can see it drop in boxes. Brian would normally be monitoring the progress on that iPad, but handing it back to me led to a small glitch that we end up dealing with later. All right, so I'm getting on my flight line, kind of pinching and zooming. I like to get nice and tight, so I make sure that I uh, hit right over my track and my track vector is a spaghetti line that uh, goes back and forth. Uh, as I capture, I'm going to have uh, lock-in, wings level on the horizon very visually and then I'm just driving with the rudder uh, to maintain my uh, course track. So uh, about 65 knots to uh, get a nice slow pass over the airfield. We're building a lot of data, a lot of overlap front to front to front and uh, this allows us to build a pretty amazing data product. Hood River traffic, Yellow Cub, uh, 2,000 feet overhead, aerial survey maneuvering, uh, east-west, Hood River. All right, now as we get to the end of the flight line, I'll go away from the next flight line to give myself time to turn around and get established back on track. The Cub is cheating to do this kind of work with because I've got so much rudder authority and I can go slow, so as long as I don't get grossly off, I can correct very quickly and just hit it, hit it, hit it. This kind of flying is a lot of fun and these sensors are pretty phenomenal. Their capabilities can do anything from a multi-spectral crop analysis. Uh, that gives us a map of chlorophyll health and is indicative of plant health as a result. Uh, we live in orchards, so you can use that. Corn, soybeans, any, any crop really. Uh, we use it for wildfire fighting. 
Uh, this particular camera has a thermal auto detect, so if it detects a heat signature, it can alert you automatically, which is actually a phenomenal application for uh, anti-poaching. Uh, we've helped equip a uh, tail dragger aircraft that uh, went to Africa, and they're using the auto detective heat signatures to um, identify large mammals within the preserve, track them, and ensure their safety. I've had very, very high time pilots um, consider this some of the most difficult flying that they've ever had to do. Uh, when you do this all day long in 90 degree heat in the summer, um, they painted the side of the airplane a couple times, lots of turning, uh, lots of kind of disorientation if you're not used to it. I can describe it as instrument aerobatics. Time spent in turns is uh, time lost, so you want to uh, get back on track right away. And then once you're on track, your scan is altitude, wings level, airspeed. A lot of transition from visual to uh, instrument. All right, now just like that, we're on our last uh, photo pass. I had a feeling these gaps between the photo pass lines weren't correct, but I didn't speak up. Uh, depending on flight line spacing, you're, there's all kinds of different cadences to uh, the flying of it, the, the turning out, turning uh, inbound. Uh, if they're nice and tight, you got to get away, come back in. But if they're big, wide spacing at high altitude, you just turn towards it. If I can be at speed with the Cub, my favorite thing is to uh, get on the next flight line by doing a bit of a maneuver here. So hold on. We'll go up and away. We're trading uh, airspeed for altitude. As my airspeed drops, I wing over because I've got uh, a reduction in forward momentum and then pull little G's coming out. Get back on my altitude and get right back on my flight line. I enjoy doing that all day long. I handed the iPad back to Brian and he immediately noticed the issue that I should have pointed out earlier. We're going to redo this. Is it because uh, there was not enough coverage? Like there weren't uh, close enough, or were not high enough? Not high enough. So because there's no overlap, does that make that one completely useless? Yep. Okay. Oh well. It's impossible to capture perfect data, but there are limits to what the system can work with. And that's where Willie comes in. He's the guy that compiles the imagery. We take the data on uh, one of these hard drives, uh, sometimes like over 100 gigabytes of data, depending on how big our study site is. So here's each one of the cameras plotted out as it was taken in its X, Y, and Z. And we can take that and lay it out in a three-dimensional format. As you can see exactly how the airplane and the camera was tilted as it went through and shot each one of these. First step that the program goes through is taking all the images and overlapping them and finding different points in each image that match. And so that's what it uses to um, guess how it should stitch each one of those together. So this is all the tie points that it, it has chosen to stitch all of these images together. So wait, everything I see there is something that more than one shot saw which it's using to overlap? Correct. And that gives us a little bit more complete picture of what it will actually look like in the final product. I'm going to zoom into the campus here and give you a different perspective. So here is everywhere we shot in three dimensions. It's using the geometry of the images, how they overlap. So it's it works kind of the same way your two eyes work. So your eyes overlap. Stereoscopically. Exactly. Wow, that's that three-dimensional point cloud then to better and more accurately lay the imagery down on a flat surface. So ideally, um, each one of the flight paths would be at the exact same altitude. The wings would be level in each one, and each one of the flight passes would have like 30% overlap in between. But that's just not realistic in a world where you're dealing with wind gusts, you're dealing with um, traffic coming in, you're getting calls from air traffic control that you need to adjust your altitude for whatever reason. And uh, luckily, the program is intelligent enough to deal with some of those abnormalities. And before anyone asks, why not just use satellite imagery? The level of resolution and detail here is almost incomprehensible. Uh, the final resolution on this was about two inch per pixel. 
and uh, maybe for some added perspective it's useful to think about it in terms of like standard commercial satellite imagery that you, that a person would see on their phone or on their device would be somewhere uh, nationwide right now we have available 10 meter if you pay you can get uh, three meters and that's like really really good stuff I mean that's crisp that's uh, taking a square pixel and it's three meters by three meters ours are two inches by two inches per pixel so it's a night and day difference. It's exponentially sharper. So I got to test my stomach one more time, riding along for the second pass with Brian. Kind of the important part of knowing how to use this technology is when things don't go as you expect, that you can uh, you know, adapt and complete the mission because you don't always have a second chance. All right, so capture complete. I'll turn that system off. We'll descend in for a nice, uh, nice little grass touchdown today. Even farm has a use yep. for thermal because uh, where the land is hot and dry is it's poorly irrigated. Where it's wet and cold is where um, there's uh, moisture retention. So uh, we use that um, in a farming. Uh, application to actually tell where tile lines are underground, the drainage tiles, and uh, where it's wet and cold is in between the dry lines where the drainage tile's at. So you can actually find out where Grandpa put tile in in the 60s on the North 40 just based on imagery at the right time of the year. And you mentioned poaching, but it's not just animals to that. Uh, we're looking at uh, their search and rescue applications for thermal imagery and using the, the kind of the next phase of research for everything is using object-based image analysis and artificial intelligence to say here's a thermal band here's a threshold of temperatures that should match the target we're looking for so you put like a buffer around the temperature of a human body and then it may return a hot rock as well as humans um, so how do you differentiate between them then you can bring in the color imagery and say look at the size and shape and texture and arrangement of those pixels so you can start to take 1500 targets down to three targets in your useful area and on the fly you can be doing automated detection of things go five papa julia at uh, final runway two five grass So thanks again to Brian from Hood Tech Aero for flying with me. These are the types of community driven productions that I love doing. In some cases I spend literal years on productions and I can't thank the ongoing sponsors and Patreon supporters enough for being a part of creating authentic storytelling like this. And if you're interested in being part of it, the Patreon supporters do get behind the scenes looks at stuff, raw cuts, and just insights and input into what I'm doing at any given time. We are back to trying to restart the Africa trip to see what's going on down there with this tech, so hopefully that can happen soon. In the meantime, keep your flight chops sharp. That's all there is to it. You can pinch and zoom on the map. Can't screw it up too much. You can drop it out the window though. I prefer you don't do that one.